Um, so thank you very much for uh, this opportunity for me to join as a keynote presenter uh, on this topic of um, more inclusive cities. So I'll be talking about um, urban green issues, you know, the, the pressing issues at the moment and um, uh, participatory solutions uh, in many parts of the world and especially in, in Asia. And uh, um, as uh, Simone mentioned, I'm with Big Trees Foundation and also Thai Arboriculture um, Association. Um, during my um, keynote presentation, um, I will also have Frank Mastro Bueno of Planet Geo USA, who has been working with Big Trees and here in Bangkok with BMA, um, doing tree inventory and tree uh, canopy assessment. So he'll be joining me a little later as part of the keynote. So let's begin. Um, so I'll just uh, mention a little bit again before we go into the specifics of uh, inclus inclusivity, which is um, urban issues in, in Asia. Of course, uh, the issue of um, uh, urbanization, of you know, overpopulation and um, other problems are not unique to anywhere in the world. But to get more specific, um, according to the Asian, Asian Development Bank, um, three of the top uh, five carbon dioxide emitters uh, and uh, among the most polluted cities in the world are in Asia. And on top of that, many cities have been built, you know, in the deltas of rivers and, you know, to link to, you know, the ports would link to the global economy. So we're uh, very flood prone, as you can see in the photos in my slide. And this one is uh, actually, not, actually not this year, but, you know, we see this kind of flooding in Bangkok um, uh, quite a bit. And on top of that, um, uh, another, I guess, general problem, you know, the common problem is that um, low income areas generally tend to have less access and have less of a, uh, you know, in terms of uh, access to uh, green public spaces. So, but then again, you know, the situation is not all that hopeless and uh, all everything points towards uh, cooperation, you know, uh, working, uh, different parties working uh, together, different sectors uh, coming together and sharing their uh, resources. So I've been, uh, you know, looking around, of course, these days you have to go around virtually. And I'd like to talk uh, to bring up some very nice examples from uh, Europe. First, uh, to show that um, the trend is definitely more towards uh, more inclusivity and especially uh, bringing different parties together to create uh, one common space that can benefit as many as possible. And an excellent um, project is in uh, Fedora, Spain. And this is uh, quite a few years ago when the uh, residents um, proposed to the city that uh, the existing sports center in the city should be turned into partially at least into a, a green uh, public space. Um, and before that, uh, only members who pay fees are allowed. So, you know, after working with authorities, the landscape architects and, and um, you know, other fellow residents, uh, they finally uh, have been able to turn a part of that uh, sports center into a public park, an area with uh, 8.2 uh, hectares on the river and complete with sports facilities. And another thing is, um, which is, uh, I think for me is, is a, a popular trend right now is to convert existing spaces, you know, uh, oftentimes um, underutilized in cities and making them more useful, making more, them more uh, accessible to, to more people. And this is uh, the Oasis Schoolyards project in France, in uh, Paris. And they're now going to uh, different schools and um, working with uh, students and uh, residents to turn um, open spaces in schools into uh, green spaces that is not only beneficial to students, but also to uh, vulnerable populations, especially the elderly, you know, especially during uh, heat waves. So they have uh, some place to, to cool off. So we're not talking about, you know, an expensive design or uh, not necessarily uh, looking for, you know, a, a big uh, amount of money to, to buy new land, but converting uh, existing spaces into, you know, a more 
uh, public that can be benefit um, as many people as possible. Um, closer it to Bangkok in Asia, um, again, uh, to cite the paper by the Asian Development Bank, you know, uh, we're seeing governments, people, um, uh, NGOs coming together and uh, trying to change uh, their urban environments. Like the top photo is from uh, way in, in Vietnam, where um, neighborhoods are being revitalized, also in uh, Malacca, uh, Malaysia. Uh, another uh, example is from Udon Thani in northeastern um, Thailand. Um, it's that picture, probably not a very, um, uh, you know, uh, something we would be proud of in Thailand, but but we're working on it, and as you can see, the access to that uh, green space in the back is, is not all that great. So the city, the local authorities, are doing uh, walks, you know, photo voice walks with um, the residents, as well as doing uh, a mental mapping by interviewing um, visually challenged participants, um, you know, residents of their. Uh, town to describe, you know, mentally describe a mental map of the specific challenges that they have when they try to get to a green space. And of course, um, footpath access is, uh, you know, a, a challenge for many people. And uh, hopefully, the city will take these um, uh, findings from from public participation to improve their green spaces. Um, now, bring it even closer to uh, this. Um, meeting are some of the issues or a situation that we experience in Bangkok. And uh, as a resident here myself, we hear all the time that uh, a top complaint by uh, Bangkok residents is that we have um, too few public parks. We may have um, a number of big parks, but um, you know we would like to see more and more of them. And uh, many times you um, see uh, narrow green strips along uh, utility lines that are um, not very easy to maintain. But of course, um, we're getting good news this year. And this year, as you will find out later on um, at the um, virtual uh, field trip on Friday, that, uh, that Bangkok is, is getting uh, at least two, three very big uh, parks. And, and that's a good uh, news for um, the city. But the, the problems that we encounter all the time is land availability and uh, we can certainly use more help from landowners and landscape um, architects to help identify uh, land and uh, you know, available spaces and you know, the um, sustainable designs for uh, the upcoming new spaces. Uh, the downside is that when you talk about public budgeting, you know, it seems that you know, we, we might be seeing uh, construction of roads and bridges or then green spaces. So um, if we have more systematic collaboration, you know, among different parties, especially uh, public advocacy groups, I think we can see uh, more uh, public spaces being created by uh, through participation. Another hurdle for Bangkok, and again, probably the same for many other cities, is that when it comes to uh, regulations, you know, we seem to have uh, a lot of it on paper, you know, regulations against uh, destruction of green space, trees, or uh, public uh, land encroachment. So um, they need to sort of step up on enforcement. And at the same time, the public, you know, um, like uh, people, civic organizations, like like big trees and others, we need to be more, we need to keep staying vigilant and um, watch out for uh, any damage of, of uh, public green property. So where do we um, come in? Um, I uh, would like to say that uh, we've come quite a long way in terms of um, uh, arboriculture in uh, Thailand, although it's still um, in the initial stages. Uh, what we're trying to do is to um, help um, resolve conflicts uh, between communities and developers, as well as authorities. We have a partnership of over 70 organizations which are called um, the Thailand Urban Tree um, Network. And uh, We Park, for instance, is part of this uh, network as well. Um, we have a pretty good relationship with the uh, authorities. Um, and uh, as well, we uh, go and in, into different uh, places 
and um, working with uh, local authorities and even training um, the locals, the, the staff on how to better uh, protect their trees, uh, maybe eventually becoming um, arborists so they can protect their own uh, green spaces um, uh, better. Uh, like the, the, the lady in the top uh, photo is one of the arborists that who are, who are working with the association. And you might see the, these uh, men in their uh, green t-shirts, they're uh, actually surveying trees along Pattaya Beach. And what happened there was there was a, uh, an attempt to cut down all the trees along the beach and it was a public uproar. So um, uh, our organization as well as uh, the Thailand, Thai, uh, our association of landscape architects you know, went over and we spoke to the authorities and uh, they've, they've stopped uh, the cutting of the trees and, and working with us to train their staff. And also uh, coming up soon, uh, we have just been contacted by the Thai National Environment Board that uh, they would like us to help with the project to uh, save and also re rehabilitate um, trees that are habitats to a native species of, of parrots in Nontaburi, which is close to uh, Bangkok. So we will try and, and do that, you know, to um, make sure the trees are strong and also uh, working with the locals to how to uh, better care of those uh, parrot trees. Um, uh, in terms of professional standards, we uh, work with the ISA, the International Society of Arboriculture, um, universities in Thailand, as well as the Thai Professional Qualifications Institute to establish um, arboriculture as an essential um, job and, and part of uh, an essential part of uh, urban green uh, maintenance. As you can see, we uh, this is uh, when we went to Atlanta for an ISA uh, leadership. Uh, meeting and um, my pictures are showing, um, you know, the training and uh, um, tree inf inventory and canopy mapping that we're starting um, in Bangkok and uh, yeah, the various meetings we're having so that um, arboriculture will become a more uh, sort of recognizable um, profession in the near future. So I will I'll actually break here so that um, Frank from Planet Geo can come in and talk a little bit more about our uh, work together on uh, online tree inventory and canopy mapping. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen briefly and, and Frank will come in with his own slides. So I'll be back in a few minutes. Yeah, thank you, Raya. And uh, Frank, over to you. And uh, be mindful of time, Frank. Sorry to be a pest, but. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I can move quickly. Uh... Thank you, Aurea, and uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be joining you. Um, happy to share the experience that I have in making trees a bigger part of our cities and, and making sure that our cities are more inclusive to incorporate everybody and provide better access to all the benefits that trees provide. So I'll, I'll get right to it. Uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I got my career started conducting tree inventories and surveys right after college. Um, did that for a few years and kind of just eventually worked my way up to be the urban forester for the state of Rhode Island, the United States. Um, after going back to school to get an MBA, I joined Planet Geo. Um, I have been with the company for almost three years now. Uh, started working with cities, universities, and tree care companies to just implement software and data collection analysis solutions to improve the status quo of their programs, whatever that may be for their programs. Now I work with our international partners uh, to do the same and uh, Aurea, our partners and clients, uh, Aurea falls under that category and uh, we've been supporting her work accordingly. Uh, so just a little bit more about the company. We are a uh, United States based company with partners all across the world. Uh, we have tree and asset management software. We do tree inventory and assessments. We provide geospatial mapping services and also urban forestry consulting plans. Uh, if you need a management plan, any type of consulting services, what we do. Uh, we've got uh, four different software products. I uh, won't really talk much about that, um, but you can definitely check it out if you'd, if you'd like to take a look on our website. So the basics, uh, basically uh, I, I had thought about uh, how, how do we uh, improve the, the process of uh, improving the status quo of our cities 
when we have very limited resources. And uh, we were on a meeting with Dan Lamb, the president of the Arbor Day Foundation uh, within the past year. I asked him that question and he actually said, you know, it's imperative that you build a narrative and, and you can be able to tell a story. Uh, and why is that? Well, because the story is really how you connect. Uh, data is, is a critical element of that story too. How, how do you tell a compelling story? Well, really ultimately with data and we, we build a narrative with that data. It helps us demonstrate progress. And what types of data do we use? Well, typically we use either a tree canopy assessment or a tree inventory. And that gives us a snapshot of what the city's looking like. The tree canopy assessments, just a real brief breakdown of the difference. Uh, it's more of a top-down analysis, We're looking at the city from the top. It's, it's uh, using satellite data. Uh, it's really just quantitative. We're quantifying how much of the city is covered with tree canopy and how much might be covered with other types of land cover. We can't distinguish one individual tree from another. And the tree inventory is a, is a different process. We're looking at things from the bottom up, and uh, it's a quantitative and a qualitative approach, but it does require manual data collection. It requires an arborist to visit and assess every tree. But accordingly, we can look at a lot more pieces of information like species, health, relative age, so on and so forth. And so again, just kind of some images to illustrate the concept. When we're looking at a tree canopy assessment, we're looking at the city from the top down. And when we're doing a tree inventory, we're walking around and looking at individual trees. And so just to give you a better idea is the difference between a tree canopy assessment and tree inventory. This is a just quick little GIF that demonstra demonstrates how we can turn satellite imagery of a city into land cover classification. The dark green, as you can see, is trees. The light green would be other vegetation. That tan color would be just kind of like an open lot. Uh, blue would be water. Buildings are red. Roads are black, so on and so forth. So when we get this imagery, we can actually break this down uh, by any different geography. And that's how we get meaningful insights. And so this right here um, is a visualization tool of a canopy study. And you can see how we can isolate different individual neighborhoods. These are actually census block groups, which uh, is the United States Census performed once every 10 years. It collects data on all facets of dem demographics of the country, like average income, health data, so on and so forth. Um, there's a reason why we break those, uh, why we tend to break this uh, canopy study down by those neighborhoods. Um, and we'll see that in the next slide. So we can look at the way tree canopy cover has changed over the course of a number of years. But really this is where we get the most actionable insights is we're able to incorporate any other data that we might have associated with those neighborhoods and use these sliders to prioritize. So. If we look at, um, if we have data for these neighborhoods as to the percentage of the population in each neighborhood that's living below the poverty line, we can prioritize that. And as already mentioned before, we're basically discovering now as we're doing these analysis, the technology has really only been available in um, a resolute enough form to be able to provide meaningful analysis for about 10 years. But what we are discovering is indeed lower income neighborhoods generally have less tree canopy cover and may have more health problems such as asthma as a result. So we can really drill down into, if I only have a limited amount of funds, how do I move things forward? This is just an example of a tree inventory. We're looking at individual pieces of information on an individual tree. Ultimately, we get a, a compilation of the data that provides us insights into how our urban forest is doing. Um, well, what about the real world? Uh, swaying public opinion or any opinion is hard. How do we do that? Well, leadership supports what they know. And without information, problems are nebulous. So roadblocks become a reality. And not everybody, uh, as Aurea even previously mentioned, is able to go out and get all the data they need right at the beginning. But we can be more inclusive by putting good information out to the public. And public opinion always sways political opinion. So information is key. Get it however you can. And even if you're on a tight budget, we'll take a bite-sized approach. And we've seen a lot of cities be very successful with this, this approach. It's basically the creation of a virtuous cycle. You invest in good information, even if it's just a little bit. And even if you're, you're collecting it yourself and it's in a small area, that allows you to make better decisions and obtain better results to demonstrate the value of good information. 
And we can just do this in a number of different ways. We can, again, uh, continue to provide this information and move the conversation forward. Uh, some examples would be a representative sample. You can go out and, and just take samples of the city. You can do a point-based survey like you'd find in a free tool like the iTree tools that are put out by the US Forest Service. Anyone in the world can download them and use them. Uh, and you can even collect data in, in pilot areas. And that's actually what we're in very early conversations where you just brought us into about doing in the city of Bangkok is an inventory and a canopy study in a very small area. Once we get some data, there's many tools we can use to put it out there. Software we use has a community engagement map. It's a map you can put in any website. Uh, we can look at tree inventories. It's just simplified for members of the public to be able to look at and gain some actionable insights. Uh, this is what the canopy study looks like. A couple of cool examples, the city of Palo Alto, they'll actually pay to put a tree on private land so long as the landowner agrees to take care of it. And they use this software to log watering activities for the grants that fund these tree planting programs. Uh, we can also crowdsource pieces of information. For example, this is an organization in uh, Belgium that is using uh, the software to crowdsource potential planting locations from citizens. They've got about 11,000 trees in the software now, 11,000 potential planting locations all throughout Belgium. Uh, so that is uh, the speed version. Uh, hopefully uh, that was, wasn't too fast, but if anybody has any questions at the end uh, about the, some of these more technical elements, my email address is up on a slide. Feel free to reach out. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. That was fast but intense. <laughs> uh, Oraya, uh, back to me. Back to you. And if you could please try to wrap up in, uh, I don't say, three, four minutes. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to have to sharing, Frank. Sorry. This is a uh, oh, so, so, actually so, from me. Ah, yeah. Sorry, it's okay. uh, Frank's yeah, presentation yeah, yeah. on sorry. your screen. We, okay. we actually were sharing. Uh, okay, twice sorry. All right. So thank you, Frank. And uh, like Frank was saying that we were, uh, we are working together doing a pilot project on um, surveying trees, doing tree inventory and tree canopy uh, mapping right now, but on a very small scale uh, to begin with. So uh, we hope to expand. Uh, that kind of work for uh, better tree uh, and green space management in Bangkok and, and elsewhere in Thailand. And of course, um, another very important partnership that we have uh, in uh, including, you know, involving community uh, engagement as much as possible would be uh, the landscape architects. And uh, when Josephon from We Park himself will be talking later about how they've been working hard engaging communities, landowners, and even doing crowd uh, funding so that uh, we can have uh, more uh, pocket parks uh, around Bangkok. And, and uh, we hopefully, we park will expand to other cities in, in uh, Thailand as well. So as a result of we park and um, their um, partners, uh, they've been able to bring green spaces to lower income areas, you know, with uh, affordable solutions and uh, with community uh, input. And as you can see from from the photos, that you know the the residents are very interested. You know, once the uh, one of the pocket parks were completed, you know the children came and it became suddenly became very popular for uh, the residents. So uh, that I think it, it's great that we're not just looking at big huge uh, uh, parks, but also pocket parks uh, here and there that are maybe more common in in Europe or in the states, but. Uh, uh, Bangkok is certainly coming along with uh, collaboration among different parties. And so um, I think um, I'm almost done with my uh, presentation and uh, I would like to say that uh, we will certainly learn uh, so much more from uh, this uh, meeting and also from the successful cases that will follow. But certainly uh, you hang on a little later, my uh, panel discussion uh, will uh, come up with some very uh, specific details on uh, cities and inclusivity. And this includes uh, Kun Yosapon of We Park, and also he's also an, a landscape architect. There's uh, Fatima from Peru, who will be talking about uh, her uh, urban greening initiative in Lima, and Roslan Yakov from the Malaysia Arboriculture um, Association. And so uh, I will end my uh, presentation now and head back to. Uh, Simone, and thank you very much for uh, having me here.